I was uh, just saying to Simon that I do a lot of this at the moment and it doesn't usually bother me and I look out here and I see so many familiar faces and old friends and I'm shaking like a leaf. <laughs> As Alan said, that's the official academic title. It's not worth anything much really. Um, James was robbed. That's the message I come with. And uh, I'm going to start by setting some of the background because so frequently people think the Battle of Flodden, one day on a rainy Friday afternoon in 1513, what's the relevance? Bizarrely enough, Flodden is a very, very small sideshow in a European war, being fought largely between these two characters, Louis XII of France and Julius II, the Pope, until the middle of 1513, when he died, he was 70 years old. He's known as a warrior Pope, uh, and his interests are really um, martial, that's the best way to describe him. He invented the Swiss Guard, uh, and he's pouring all of the Vatican State's money into the war with Louis over Venice. Venice couldn't be more remote than, uh, than anywhere, I suppose, than uh, to northern Scotland or Scotland and northern England. Um, but there you are. We get sucked into a war between these two guys um, <coughs> over who's going to control Venice. And the control of Venice is not just simply uh, beautiful canal boulevards, um, nice bridges and architecture. Um, it's really over the control of the Venetian trading routes out into the Adriatic, down into the Eastern Mediterranean, and then off across land and through the Red Sea out to the Far East. This is what they're arguing over. On the English side, we have Henry VIII, who at this point is 22 years old. Now, there's no good early images of Henry VIII. There's one of him when he's about 16 or 17, and this one's painted when he's about 28. So the period we're talking about is straddled. But you have to put that uh, Holbein-esque, large, massive shoulder-padded man out of your mind. You also have to put that... Um, thing that's given to us by history books, particularly school history books, that Henry VIII is the great reformer. Um, ultimately, he's a man who wants to be a Protestant. He wants to reform the English church. That's all nonsense as well. This man is going to be Catholic till the day he dies. Essentially, he shouldn't be king. His elder brother should have been king. He's not had any training in statehood. Um, he's interested primarily in hunting and uh, women. Um, martial pursuits, more women, uh, and anything basically that can distract him from court life. On the north side of the border, we have James IV, said by many recently to be the finest Tudor monarch. Uh, sorry, the finest Stuart monarch. I'm going to make mistakes like that all night. <laughs> Get used to it. The finest Stuart monarch, bar none. None of the Charleses, none of his preceding Jameses, none of his following Jameses. And he may, they may be right. Um, he's certainly into his uh, military technology, learning, science. Uh, he likes women too. Uh, but he also likes um, unifying Scotland. And in the latter part of the preceding decade, in the 1490s, he suppressed the Lordship of the Isles extremely brutally. Uh, and both myself and Simon have dug on sites so overlooking some of this business. Um, so he's basically the man that unifies Scotland, ruling with an iron fist. He has control over a country which is relatively small, uh, but on the European stage, he punches at a great, much, much greater weight. He's respected in France, in Spain, uh, and until he supports France against the Pope in the Papal States as well. He's sucked into this because the French call on the old alliance uh, two le letters leave France in the summer of 1513 uh, after Henry has invaded northern French, France on behalf of the Pope to try and create a second front in that war over Venice. Uh, two letters leave France, travel to the Scottish court at Linlithgow. Um, one, a diplomatic letter from the king. Uh, the other, a slightly more personal letter from the queen. And this is where that famous request, please take one yard of English soil comes in the queen's letter. It's also accompanied by a topaz ring, uh, a ring supposed to uh, demonstrate sisterly love, which when he finally leaves Edinburgh heading for the English border, he's said to be seen wearing. So receiving this letter, Henry in France 
James, determined to bring Henry back from France, simplified massively because we don't have time to go into all the ins and outs of this. James orders a muster on or around the 17th of August in Edinburgh. On the 17th of August, he marches out of Edinburgh at the, most, at the front of the most modern artillery train certainly Britain has ever seen and possibly Europe's ever seen. Common misconception is that Mons Meg is in that train. Mons Meg has been retired about 10 years earlier. The train consists of five six inch 32 pound cannon and 15 four inch cannon. Each of these cannon takes about a thousand people to move. It's a massive undertaking. 20 oxen or 25 oxen depending on the size at the front, five oxen at the back to act as a brake. They're on traveling carriages. Behind them, a couple of oxen are pulling the combat carriage. Behind that, there's a, a wagon which has a crane to move the gun tube from one to the other when they get into combat. Behind that, there's a blacksmith, a couple of wagons, a couple of oxen on each wagon. Every oxen in this train is shod. Every oxen probably, or pair of oxen at least, has a boy to look after them. The blacksmith has his wife, his journeyman, his assistants, his um, apprentices in tow. Behind him, the cooper, who's looking after the barrels. The barrels have got water, beer, um, gunpowder. Behind them, another wagon with shot in it. And so it goes on. And when you begin to tot it all up, each one of these guns is moving with about a 1,000 people. Now, the accounts tell us simply that James leaves Edinburgh with 100,000 men. Got to throw that out the door. In medieval terms, 100,000 men just means a great host. Um, and numbers we can talk about, but closer to the battle. So he leaves probably with more than 50,000 men, women, and children. This is the other thing we've got to throw out the window here. History is written as an all-male affair at this time. Battles even more so. Um, there are probably 20 or 30,000 women traveling with this army uh, and their children, uh, wives, camp followers, <coughs> camp wives, all of those euph euphemisms, um, as well as people who are genuinely married. Heading down the road, uh, their exact route is uncertain. It's something we're going to start researching next year, uh, but probably um, along to, it's gone straight out of my head, the Royal Borough of, beginning with... Haddington. Thank you, H. Haddington, thanks. Number two, uh, and then down through the, the foothills there, down to a place called Ellenkirk, uh, which is about 15 miles northwest of Duns. That's number three <coughs> on that map. Um, at Ellenkirk, they meet, meet another large muster. This is the border muster. Uh, men from all across the borders coming in there. Again, it's described as another great host or another 100,000 people. From Ellenkirk, they head down to the border past Duns, number four. Um, and the traditional accounts would have it that the whole 200,000 people cross the border at Coldstream on the 22nd of August. In reality, they probably cross at three different places, laying siege to Warp Castle, which now survives as a mot on the English side of the border, and Norham Castle, eight miles along the river, closer to, to Berwick, um, <coughs> also on the English border. Norham Castle being the most powerful English castle on the border. It's the largest fortification on the border. Provided for the English government by the uh, Prince Bishops of Durham. It's their contribution to the defence of the realm, but also their contribution to the defence of the salmon rights on the river. This is where their fish for a Friday morning comes from. Now, for James, Norham Castle is unfinished business. He was down with Mons Meg in uh, 1497. He failed to get through the front door on that occasion, although he did knock the back off the bishop's palace down into the river. Um, the palace was relieved, uh, relieved by, uh, the, the castle was relieved by the Earl of Surrey uh, before he could get in. And this is typically James's tactic. He comes, he attacks castles or raids across the border, and then when an English army turns up, he faints away. And the previous crop of books written about Flon, those written around 1999 to 2003, have suggested that James's primary strategic aim for this campaign is to take Norham Castle. Unfinished business, we'll get it done. The French Queen gets her one yard of English soil, and everybody's happy. 
he is then conned into fighting a battle by the English commander. And what I hope to prove over the next 55 minutes or so um, is that, in fact, James left Edinburgh with battle in his heart. His intention was to fight a great battle um, with an English army and make it clear to Henry VIII once and for all that he was at least his equal, if not his better. The first piece of evidence I would like to offer to you tonight uh, revolves around a, an event that we now know as James's final parliament with hindsight. In reality, this is a field parliament. These things aren't unusual. What's unusual about it is twofold. One, that it happens before the battle, and two, that it happens at the behest of his senior nobles. So they ask him to hold it before the battle. The function of a field parliament relating to an invasion or a battle is to um, basically uh, offer his nobles dispensation for the costs of wardship. What that's saying is, if you die on the battlefield, we won't charge for wardship. So it's the cost of death duties dispensed with. It's perfectly reasonable. Usually happens after the battle. The reason being the king can then tot up how much it's going to cost him and make a decision as to whether he's going to do it or not. <coughs> Here we have, on the 24th of August, at Twizel Bridge, next to Twizel Castle, a parliament where James gives this dispensation. This, this is nearly 15 days before the battle's even going to be fought. And perversely, the English don't even know the country's been invaded yet. Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey, is sitting in Pontefract, Pontefract Castle, number one on the chart there, and he's waiting for news of a Scottish invasion. It's been building up right through the summer. Everybody knows it's going to come. Henry's gone off to, to France. He's left his wife, Catherine of Aragon, in charge of the country, and Thomas Howard in charge of the defence of the north of the realm. Thomas Howard slightly miffed about that because he is actually probably the greatest general in England at the time. Um, his background is that he was on the wrong side at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. He and his father were thrown into the Tower of London for three years after that. And then he was renovated into the English court. Henry VII recognised the family's potential. But as the Dukes of Norfolk, they were defrocked. They were relegated to their slightly uh, lesser title of the Earl of Surrey. Uh, and he acted basically as Henry VII's favourite general throughout the man's reign. Henry VIII, therefore, wants to sideline him. He doesn't want a victory in France commanded by his father's favourite general. That's nothing to him. By 1513, Thomas Howard's 70 years old, which these days is nothing. It's merely middle-aged. Back then, it's like being 120. Uh, no hip replacements. Both his hips are shot and he's being dragged around in a wagon. He can't get onto a horse, it's too painful, um, and he spends a lot of time in the back of a wagon. For this particular event, it's going to be a family affair. He will bring with him his son, Thomas Howard, his eldest surviving son, simply known as the Lord Admiral, so we don't get them confused, and his wastrel younger son, about 30 years old, imagine Prince Andrew, <coughs> nightclubs, women, that's his reputation. Edmund Howard. As soon as he hears on the 25th, the day after the Scots Parliament, that the Scots have invaded Northern England, he sets out up the road. He stops in York, where he picks up from the Treasury a purse of 20,000 livres, sorry, 14,000 livres, get the numbers right. Uh, this is a typical example of what that purse would have contained. It's a silver half groat worth two penny, and this is to pay the army with. Unlike the Scots army, which is mustered in a medieval sense, you owe the king 40 days, turn up. The English army is mustered in the terms of you're going to war, but we will pay you. Um, and most of the coinage in circulation in the north of England at the time is still Henry VII coinage. This is minted in York in 1507, two years before Henry VIII comes to the throne. He simply hadn't got round to minting his own coins in any great number by this point. From there, he moves forward to Durham. In Durham, he collects St. Cuthbert's banner. No English army heading into Scotland with St. Cuthbert's banner at its front has ever lost on the battlefield. I don't believe for a second that Thomas Howard believes or cares about this. Only insofar 
only insofar as his men believe it, and he's a pragmatist. From there, he heads up to Newcastle, and he's in Newcastle on the night of the 1st of September, waiting for the Mary Rose, the same ship which will sink and will be raised out of the depths by Margaret Rule in the early 1980s, but without all of the superstructure that put it under the water. At this point, the Mary Rose is two or three years old, um, and it's under the command of his son, Thomas Howard, the Lord Admiral, his eldest surviving son. We're told Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey, spends the night praying for his son's safe delivery because the night of the 1st, 2nd of September, there's a massive storm in the English Channel uh, and the North Sea. Um, and when on the morning of the 2nd of September, the fleet led by the Mary Rose comes up to the time, um, he's mightily relieved. Very specifically, we're told then, that 971 men march off the English fleet to form the core of Thomas Howard's personal force on the battlefield. We also infer, since we don't know where he got them from, that most of his guns came off the English fleet as well. They're the right kind of guns to be on the fleet of the day. From there, having issued a command for a muster when he was way back down here, at a place called Bolton, just outside of Annick Castle, to the west of Annick Castle, he heads north into Northumberland, picking up the Devil's Causeway, the Roman road that runs from Corbridge up to Berwick. And he's up there by the 5th of September, meeting his commanders and his men. This is where James supposedly gets trapped into fighting, because a letter leaves the Earl of Surrey to James, ch challenging him to fight on the 5th of September. It's sent to Ford Castle in the hands of uh, James, uh, um, the Earl of Surrey's uh, herald, the Rouge Croix Pursuant. Um, and again, it's a pair of letters. This is not uncommon in medieval diplomacy. You have the formal letter, uh, which lists all of the crimes that James has perpetrated in the north of, of England, the rape and pillage of castles and so on and ends up with this short statement, where said Earl will be ready to try the rightfulness of the king in battle by Friday next. I've added the ninth just for reference. If the king shall wait. <clears throat> to paraphrase, I'm coming. If you hang on, I'll be there by the ninth. Now, these um, heralds are supposed to pass in violet. They're supposed to be able to come and go with total freedom. But they form a secondary function and that is as a spy. So when James's heralds reach Thomas Howard, he meets them a mile outside the English camp because he doesn't want them to see the size of the English army. When the Rouge Croix meets James, he actually meet, meets him in the Scottish camp and fully understands the extent of the uh, <coughs> fortifications that the, that, uh, that the king has managed to achieve. This is a wee map and it's essentially the second piece of proof that would point, I would point to to say that James intends to fight. Because he wouldn't have made this much effort if he was just going to fade away. That's, that's the basic argument. We've had our final parliament. He's also created this um, strategic location in the north of Northumberland. Now, Simon sort of said I had to use this thing. So, Walt Castle... Norham Castle and eight miles of the Tweed. He's got free use of either side of the Tweed because of holding those two castles. This gives him his lines of communication, retreat, supply, everything he needs to link him to Scotland. Then along the River Till, he takes the castles and crossing points. So he has Twisel Castle, which is actually in ruins after one of his own raids in 1497, but with the new bridge next to it built in 1511. He takes Eatle Castle, Two, two crossing points, a bridge and a, um, a ford, and he takes Ford Castle. And on the 5th of September, he's sitting pretty like this, with a back, uh, effectively with a flank defence, which is going to defend about against any army coming along the Tweed Valley, which may have been delivered, if the wind is suitable, to Berwick. That, that is an English tactic, but it'll only work if the wind's suitable to get the ships up there. The other option is any English army coming up through the middle of Northumberland along the Devil's Causeway, um, in which case he holds Ford Castle at the end of his flank defence, 
and he's got his men digging in for 10 days on the top of Flodden Hill. They can't get round down here because of the, uh, because of the Cheviot foothills. So what he's created is a box which gives him control of a chunk of North Northumberland. This is a very 1940s idea where he can operate with impunity. This has been a lot of work. Sieges of four castles, um, manning of four castles, digging for 10 days, creating a fortification on the top of Flodden Hill. Not the kind of work he would expend if he was expecting to faint away. So James, having made that mistake of letting the Rouge Croix um, see his camp, takes him prisoner, sends his own herald back, the Isler, and agrees to fight no later than the 9th of September. Now, traditionally, the argument is James does this. Um, he does it because he's trapped into it by the letter, uh, the letter creating a position whereby his, his code of chivalry won't allow him to refuse. If you don't mind me saying, total and a bunkum. <laughs> Um, essentially, James is planning to fight, and it's no skin off his nose to say, yeah, fine, the ninth, I'll sit here and wait for you. In fact, the longer I wait, the stronger my fortifications become. So he responds simply with uh, the same king would abide him in battle by the day prefixed. Now, we have two documents which give us a, a contemporary primary uh, report of the battle and what happened before, during and after. Both written by the English, unfortunately. The reason for that is likely because James's papers were sacked and burned during the battle or shortly after the battle. Uh, those two documents are the Articles of Battle, which we'll touch on a little bit later, written by uh, Thomas Howard, the Lord Admiral, and The True Encounter. The True Encounter is a description of events before and during primarily um, and is said to have been written by an unknown Northumbrian on the basis that they don't know who the author is, but a lot of the use of words and descriptions are typical of the Northumbrian dialect of the day. Um, and he seems to get these place names right as well. So perhaps a little less weight should be played, placed onto the true encounter. Um, but on the 7th of September, there are two documents that are in play. One is the true encounter, one is a letter from Surrey written in the evening. And effectively what this tells us is he gets into Wooler, which is about seven miles, eight miles south of the Scottish line, Flodden Hill and Ford Castle. Uh, and he sallies out onto Millfield Plain and he sees that James has dug himself in. And conceiving that the King of Scots, to lie so strongly as aforementioned, and there was a fair plain nether part of said mountains called Millenfield, or Millfield in modern terms. My Lord Surrey tarried on the same ground all the next day, the 7th, um, and trusted, uh, and the knights, trusting that the king would descend to give him battle. That's an account after the fact. What we get from the letter that leaves Surrey's camp, signed by 25 of his senior commanders, is this. He sees that the king has withdrawn himself onto ground more like a fortress, and begs that James will come forward and wait on the Scots side of the plain on the following morning, the 8th of September. So what he's saying is, I've seen what you've got. There's no way I'm coming up the face of Flodden Hill. Come forward and we'll have a fair battle on Millfield tomorrow morning. This is how business is done in the 15th century. So what has he seen that's worried him so much? I mean, this man's an extremely skilled military commander. Um, and something's clearly concerned him about attacking the Scots on Flodden Hill. From 1769, Armstrong's map of Northumberland shows us Flodden Hill and the King's Chair with a rectangular um, depiction of a fort on top of Flodden Hill and a little pictogram depicting another fort on the top of the King's Chair. We're taking it at this point, given the name, that this is where James's personal retinue have, have set up their camp. We started excavating uh, the rectangular enclosure on the top of Flodden Hill in 2009. Um, and what we found was a, an earthbound rampart with stone faces. Having spent a lot of time digging black houses, I was on familiar territory here. We couldn't get the requisite five to 10 meters along the wall. Um, you know, you want to expose a nice big section to understand how it's built, simply because there's a mature uh, plantation on the top of the hill. So we got three meters staggered through, and this revealed 
uh, a wall that in, in its interior was about six feet from the base here to the, the top of the surviving parapet with an inside wall face, a parapet face, and an outside wall face. Slightly problematic because when you turn around and take a picture the other way, it's no more than knee high. We spent a lot of time digging out here looking for a ditch. No ditch out there, it goes straight down onto solid rock. And came to the conclusion that all the soil for filling the wall, which is a rectangular enclosure about 80 by 80 meters, had actually come from the interior. That's a view across this wall, series of substantial post holes, uh, spaced about 70 or 80 centimetres apart, disturbed by tree roots here, and d although off this cut of this slide, disturbed by tree roots just off the top as well. So we've got a series of regularly spaced, uh, apparently zigzagging post holes. Again, not enough to create a breastwork in the traditional sense on here, no palisade. Uh, what would be the point of simply putting up a wicker fence? Who can say? But we are finding bits of wicker. So our interpretation here looks like this. Our bedrock, soil on top. We find a block in the core of the wall, outside, inside. We've got this old turf line with samples out of it that can be dated. They then build up a wall face, put a parapet on top, which probably stood no more than three, three and a half feet high on this outside. And then the likelihood is they hammer in massive great stakes to support gabions or wicker baskets full of soil and earth. 1497, contemporary illustration from Switzerland. <coughs> gabions on top of an earth bank wall. At this point, we're wondering about the internal depth and we're looking to fortress construction such as the, the fortress of Celles in, in southern France where the tradition in the late part of the 15th century and the early part of the 16th century um, is not to build a big fortress with powerful walls, but to dig down into the ground and have small walls so that any incoming fire literally goes right over the top or it hits the small wall. And I think that's what we're seeing here. We've got to remember that James, although I haven't had a chance to go into all of that detail about James's exchange with France, uh, James is traveling with French military advisors and French Swiss military advisors. So he's got the latest ideas on his doorstep. And I think that's what's going on there. The problem is, and now might be the time to talk about numbers, we estimate James's army to be in the order of 70, 75,000 people. Um, you can't get 75,000 people into a, a rectangular enclosure 80 by 80 meters. Even if they stand shoulder to shoulder, face to face, back to back, you'll get about 8,000 in that space. How do I arrive at 75,000 people? Well, simply, uh, he fields 32 to 35,000 fighting men on the day. Uh, and from David Caldwell, we know that uh, an army of this period, Scots army, would be either 50-50, non-combatant combatant, or even 60-40, uh, non-combatant combatant. So we're 30 to 35,000 and possibly 35,000 to 40 non-combatants. That gives us the figure of 75,000 people in train. Our little enclosure is in this mature woodland here. The ridge is running away across. And in 1946, the RAF picked up this. So we start looking at other aerial photographic sites, this rectangular double ditch enclosure disappearing into this woodland here. is on the down facing slope, Flodden Edge, which links the King's Chair and Flodden Hill, is a quite a narrow ridge with down facing south slope and down facing north slope. So we picked that up and started looking at other aerial photographs, trying to pick out other things. And we got this on the north facing down slope. If I go back one, that's in this area. So back to back with that, we get this. Now, yeah, sure, it looks typically Iron Age. And as it turns out, it was typically Iron Age. But it has 16th century intrusions into it. Particularly interested by this possible trench here that seems to run along the face and then disappear into the wetness. And this possible trench here, we had some geophysics done. Our possible trench turned into a pit alignment. That hammers back the Iron Age date. But this one's solid enough. And lo and behold, we have a roundhouse, but it's cut by these two large rectangular areas. Now, I could spend a whole 
hour or more talking about what we found on this site over the years 2010, 2011. I'm going to abbreviate it to two slides. That's the bits that are 16th century. Our trench system and these two platform areas that cut the roundhouse. We also spend a lot of time digging a very, very nice late Romano British corn drying kiln. These, sure enough, are a pit alignment, but they have later, probably 16th century, I've got the dates back from this year, hearths inserted into the top of them. Someone's come along, seen a scoop in the ground and gone, that's a handy place to have a hearth, and they've laid it in. And those hearths are about 15 centimetres thick. Quite impressive. We excavated across a section right through uh, one of those rectangular areas, and it turned out to be a platform with lots of little ha stones hammered into it. Um, could, of course, be a, a later Iron Age or early medieval working area. I dismiss the later Iron Age thing because it's cutting the Iron Age house that's in the, that's in the enclosure. Um, but then we found this rather nice two-inch stone cannonball sitting right on the top of it, along with two shirts of medieval pottery. And one thing we know for certain is Iron Age man doesn't have cannons. That goes out the window. The other thing we've got is the trench system. Uh, and having dug World War I trenches built by British forces, this is remarkably similar in that we have a V-shaped trench with a flat bottom. It's not drainage because it runs around the contour. It's not going down the contour. And it has, although it's almost impossible to see, the vestigial remains of an upthrow on the downhill or outside. This is how the British Army made trenches in 1914. You built a parapet because if you've got a parapet, you don't have to go down so far. So you take the soil out of your ditch and drop it on the downhill side in this case. Again, we've got Iron Age and 16th century pottery from the bottom of this. So these are the defences James has. Um, we can see from aerial photographs they're likely to be replicated on the south side, and that's what geophysics is going to do for us, hopefully, in the coming year, start picking out targets for excavation on the south side. James is heavily fortified. At this point, we might say his intention is for the Earl of Surrey to march his troops up onto these fortifications, these prepared gun positions, and then get used up. That stone cannonball is telling. Um, it's telling because James knows his six and four inch cannon are useless, absolutely monumentally useless against men. Uh, but if you take a load of roughly globular balls, stuff them up the barrel, probably with a bit of wood behind them to act as a plate, and you fire that off, you've created grape shot. It's good for 250 yards, and it's devastating. That's what James is trying to do on the top of Flodden Hill. So James, slightly peeved as well at being asked to come forth and give battle, refuses to meet the Rouge Croix. He refuses, refuses to see him. And eventually, after a little bit of waiting, he sends a mess message by a servant and the famous line that comes out of him, this is extracted from James's message, uh, it beseems not an earl to hand, after that manner to handle a king, I've added in such a way. What he's saying is, I'm a king, you're a mere earl, it's often translated as a mere earl, you can't dictate to me terms. You can view it as a king throwing his rattle out of the pram, if that makes it easier for you. He's not getting his own way. The Earl of Surrey is not playing ball. This is an inter interesting counterpoint to an earlier communication between the two of them in 1503. Because in 1503, the Earl of Surrey had delivered his wife, Margaret Tudor, Henry's older sister, to Edinburgh for her official wedding. She was about 13 years old at the time. Her official wedding to the then 30-year-old James IV to seal a treaty between Henry VII and James IV. Now, as lads do with a wedding, and we've all done it at some point or another, it got to a bit of drinking. A bit of um, banter, and then James said, why don't we get the swords out and have a bit of a knock round? And the Earl of Surrey, who was 60 and even then crippled by arthritis, said to him, sir, um, it, would not, it would be beneath you to fight a mere earl. And here we have the whole thing. It's almost like James remembers that conversation. He's sending that message back to the Earl of Surrey, saying, it's beneath me to let you dictate where we're going to fight. The Earl of Surrey is no fool. He's certainly not going up the south face of Flodden Hill. Um, so on the morning of the 8th, he packs his army up, leaving Wooler, 
he marches around back onto the Devil's Causeway via this rather nice 16th century bridge with a later cladding on it. We've actually had the whole of the core out of that bridge, so we do know bits of it are original. That's Wheatwood Bridge, just outside of Edinburgh, uh, outside of Wooler. And he pitches up at Barmore Castle where they've built these, uh, love more hate them, they've built these fantastic uh, uh, cast iron gates that commemorate the English army's stay. Now, Barmore here, about five or six miles from Flodden Hill and um, Ford Castle is one of those places where an English army can camp. It's one of those regular campsites. There's a field put aside. There's probably dry firewood. They may even, if they've been, war been warned, be fresh bread and things like that waiting for them. They're coming up and down the Devil's Causeway, which runs within 500 meters of the castle at Barmore. Um, and the Earl of Surrey is guaranteed a decent bed for the night. He's pretty knackered. So he sends his son, the Lord Admiral, out onto Watch Law to have a look at the east end of Flodden Hill. The idea being there's a nice road goes right down here past Ford Castle. Uh, can we attack the east end of Flodden Hill? And Thomas Howard, the Lord Admiral, comes back with the message, uh, no, Dad, we can't. It's as equally fortified on the east end as it is on the south face. At which point the, the Council of War led by the Earl of Surrey and very much against his uh, 25 senior uh, military advisors, decides that they're going to hook round the back. On the morning of the 9th, before light, they march out of Barmore Castle, Castle and they head north to the border and hook the outflank. Now, we're on the 9th of September. We all know we're going to have our battle because it's been agreed in writing. So the English train, smaller than the Scots train, stays behind in Barmoor. This is now simply the fighting force and the immediate support that it needs, including the cannon. Um, about 10,000 men and the cannon under the Lord Admiral cross at Twizel Bridge. Presumably there's a Scots garrison there, but what I'm finding in all of this is that where the battle is so short or never occurs, they simply don't mention on either side the sieges or these small skirmishes. Whatever the story, the knobs and the big guns go across the bridge, the men ford the river, because if you put 15,000, 14,000 men across that bridge, you'd be at it all day. Although it did carry the main road traffic until 1981. Um, it's not wide enough to get that many men across in a single day. The Earl of Surrey himself, leading about 14,000, that's 10,000 men going that way, 14,000 men come to Heaton, where there's a little known ford. The likelihood is the Scots didn't know about it. Um, this ford, even today, when it's been raining for a week or two, uh, as it had been at the time of the battle, is Oxter Deep. And the men probably had to ford the river, wading up to their, at least their waist, if not their armpits. And they sneak through. In one sense, this is very like the uh, German tactic of 1939, um, in that they're avoiding the hard points, the serious crossings here and here, Ford Castle and Eatle Castle. And what the Earl of Surrey does is he wins the battle, then he goes back and he mocks up the hard points. That's very blitzkrieg. That's how they get into Poland. It's what Rommel does all across North Africa. Um, and yet we won't see it again for another 400 years. Once they cross the river around lunchtime, they start heading south. Now, it's low cloud, it's raining, there are a series of ridges across this landscape, culminating with the foothills of the Cheviots and um, Flodden Hill, and they really don't know where the Scots army is. What they're hoping to do is come up on the Scots' north side and find a way in there. What we can say from the excavations we've been doing is it's equally as well fortified on the south, on the south side and the north side. That's that's an opinion based on aerial photography, geophysics, and the excavations. Um, and had they got here, it would have ended up in a siege. What actually happens is James IV sees this maneuver, either by scout or it's just simply because you can't hide 25,000 men marching through the landscape. And he throws himself off Flodden Hill during the morning and onto Branxton Hill, the next ridge north. I have no idea about time. I'm not sure how I'm doing. Okay. Do you want to give me a, a span here? 15? That's, that's negotiation. Um, 
I'm not going to labour this then, but James has a number of options on the morning of the night. Surrender, we can rule out, because that would be just tragic. He wouldn't do that. He can break out to the south, but as I said earlier, his army is formed by 40 days feudal service, and he's 23 days into that. He could probably get to Newcastle, and his army would start to break up around him. For the same reason, he won't stay on the top of Flodden Hill and withstand a siege. He can't win a siege on English territory anyway. Um, so he turns north to fight. We can now rule this one out, I believe. It was there from the original list when I was trying to work out what was going on, but I think James wants to fight a battle. All of the archaeological manpower, person power involved in this are volunteers. There's me, one or two other professionals, and then there's a list of 400 volunteers of which we see about 100, 120 turning out on a regular basis, particularly for excavations. The other thing you've got to say is you can't play battlefield archaeology without metal detectors. So you have to cozy up to the metal detectors, whatever you think. Uh, these guys are essential um, because most of what we're looking for is metal. With the field walkers, we are finding pottery. Uh, we're also finding some great Mesolithic sites. It's, you know, we've got two really nice Mesolithic sites with structure underneath them that, that a student's dug one of them and we'll get her to dig the other site, well, next year maybe. We found one on Monday last week. So we're training volunteers to use metal detectors as well, equipping them with the right equipment. Um, we can see these movements. These are the movements on the battlefield itself. So here we've got James coming off Flodden Hill and arraying himself along Branxton Hill. Uh, and the forward coming in, the rearward joining them in the Palin's Burn, which is a little piece of dead ground north of Branxton Hill. Off the top of uh, the King's Chair, we're getting cheap pieces of bridles. You can just see in there possibly a little piece of um, red enamel. So the whole thing would have been an enameled artifact. Uh, simile horseware, this is a shield from a pair of reins. There probably would have been 100, 100 of these. Just saying that the owner is uh, well endowed financially. Uh, and finally, also the leg from what we believe to be a medieval tripod pot. Now there is some good work being done by uh, PhD student at, at Glasgow about how rich James's camp was and the thought that they're burning in incense and similar uh, in little tripod pots uh, doesn't fall out of the realms of, uh, of reality here. At the other end of Flodden Hill we're seeing more uh, military stuff. This is typical lead ingot of the 15th, 16th century. You can't date it but it's of the right form. We've got powder measures. We've got two or three of these now. Uh, you've got big guns that go bang. You put exactly the right amount of charging powder into them. Uh, if you put too little in, they go fuck. If you put too much in, they're apt to blow up in your face. We can demonstrate they're repairing weapons. This is a cross guard off a dagger of the right period, except it's not had the, the casting waste trimmed off it. It's not finished. And this thing that looks like a Morris Minor hub, we believe actually to be the hub from Scottish Targ, a small shield. Uh, it doesn't just form a defensive purpose, they need to be able to punch with it as well, um, and that gives weight to any punch. Down on the battlefield we're seeing English items, these are livery badges. Uh, nobody wore uniforms, so people wore livery badges. I'm attached to this particular Lord and Noble. We're also getting nice Tudor buttons. This one's got a sort of circular motif which we believe to be a Tudor rose. Moving across the battlefield, two more buttons, one slightly higher class made from a lead alloy, one with a cross on it, again the Tudor rose type motif, that coin, uh, cloak brooches, late 15th, 30th, 16th century, and my personal favourite, what we believe to be a sailor's palm, fits perfectly in my hand, and these little jag marks in here are where the needles bit in as it's been pushed through heavy canvas. Now of course, that could be a sack maker's palm or a leather worker's palm, but it's some sort of artisanal uh, tool for stitching. And we've got those 970 sailors that came off the fleet. This was all found around the monument where we believe the Earl of Surrey started the battle, so it makes sense that it may be a sailor's palm. Around three to four o'clock in the afternoon, the English army, having formed itself up to match the Scottish army in four units, split the Stanleys Stanleys forever maintained they had a bad battle because they weren't fighting under their own commanders. Um, split the Stanley force into four units. They advance out onto the battlefield. The Scots' heavy guns, these things, 
firing these things open up and they come in from a height above their heads sailing down and if that hits you on the head it's going to nip there's no doubt about it but it's going straight down into the ground after it's finished and you drop dead and the guys around you are just wiping bits off the English do something strange now it may have happened before but this is the first time in history it's recorded the English actually open up fire on the Scots guns this is militarily known as a counter bombardment and is officially the first counter bombardment in history the English guns don't need those thousand people to move them two small ponies the only example I've actually been able to find is in France but there you go it's a two pound two inch stave built cannon these have come off the English fleet and they're firing these nasty little things they're led with an iron dice core in them the dice forms three functions it stops the ball deforming too much when it hits something because if the ball def deforms the um, the energy of the strike is dissipated it imparts spin and because it's put into the mold cold and it floats it's offset so that gives a spin as the ball comes out and finally because it's put in cold the, the lead doesn't bound onto the ball so ultimately after the first skip because these things fly around 900 yards flat they hit the ground then they bounce up and go on for at least another 700 yards they also uh, spore or open up like a flower and they're spinning and these will take swathes of guys out possibly two in the front row two behind them or one or two going back six and eight rows so these are devastating and the argument has always been that the English then turn their fire onto the Scots units and the Scots units break and this one here goes down the hill uh, followed in a ripple effect along the line um, in a very very disorganized um, undisciplined manner I'm here to tell you you've got to put that Mel Gibson-esque uh, hairy-headed naked blue wood painted Scotsman out of your mind these guys are massively organized they're fighting with the 18-foot pike which admittedly they've not had a huge amount of training with um, but practically they, they train with a 12-foot pike or sphere so they know broadly what they're doing facing a much more medieval uh, uh, English weapon which is the billhook which is essentially just a hedging tool so the English know what they're doing with their weaponry as well the English have the longbow but it's not the last great use of the English longbow because the strings are stretching in the rain they're probably firing in a point blank range Tony Pollard tells me he doesn't believe in the Scottish short bow um, he doesn't believe in it as an effective weapon on the battlefield I'll leave it at that I'm no expert um, the Scots may have had these things arquebus early muskets uh, firing one inch balls honestly if you're given one of these to use you want to have a servant who you give it to and then you just kind of stand well back and give the fire order because they do blow up in your face there is one document that suggests they don't make it to the battlefield and they're actually stuck in Dunbar so the Scots do advance in Esteron but from the other major English account we get this is the Articles of Battle written by Thomas Howard, the Lord Admiral, on the 10th. We get two important lines, and I cannot understand how previous historians have missed this. They simply say, the Scots advance silently and in good order, German fashion. And we're not talking about goose stepping down this hill at all. German fashion is developed in Swiss Germany for pike tactics in the preceding 40 or 50 years has been used very, very effectively. James the Fourth's only got two jobs in German fashion. He's going to decide where they're going to fight on the top of Branksom Hill, and then he's going to give the go order. The go order triggers one flank or the other to start down the hill. The aim being to run into, well, not run, but basically plow into one of the English units and turn the flank. As the last man in this unit passes the front, first man in the next unit, the second unit starts off. It's orderly, it's an echelon. As the last man in this unit passes the first man in the third unit, it starts off, and so on. This gives us this effective diagonal line coming down the hill. And when this flank is turned, they will then find themselves fighting on two fronts. That's the theory. And human Huntley make it work. They're massively overwhelming the English right flank, straight out the box. Unfortunately, what James doesn't know about is the work of... Um, Paul Younger, who's now at Glasgow University, who's uh, started his career as a hydrologist in the 1970s, looking, as it happens, at the Flodden area, 
and identifies an area where the water table pops up above the ground level. This creates what he calls a convergence zone in the bottom here, hypersaturated earth. Now the question that's always asked is why didn't James know about this? He obviously didn't scout it. It's a reasonable question. Until you're digging on the 6th of September 2013, five trenches across that bog, it's like concrete. You can't break it with a pickaxe. Then we get 55 mil of rain in 12 hours. We've got five swimming pools and an inch of water sitting across the surface. And when the farm has pumped it all out, that yellow subsoil has turned into butter that you can push your finger into with a cap on top of it of hard topsoil. And this is what it must have been like for James. His men come down that hill. Imagine 80 abreast, 100 deep. The only sound is the clinking of armor and the banging of drums. They come down the hill. They run into the bog. The first row of guys, just like I did, walk through. You could jump up and down on it. It's quite solid. The second row of guys, they've got wet ankles. They're not wearing any shoes. They're not wearing any shoes because they've already agreed the best way to get purchase on the wet ground is with their feet naked or wearing socks. The third row will go through. They've got wet knees. Maybe they're trying to pull themselves out. You've got maybe 240 guys who got through, something like that. The fourth or the fifth row, we don't know for certain, but they bog down. Now, the thing about these pipe formation is movement is everything. They need to be moving forward. They're like a tank when they're going forward. But that 18-foot pike is only dangerous for two inches. And if it's stationary, you can simply walk up to it and push it aside with a gloved hand. And once you've stepped through, it can't get you again. It's over there. If he's lucky, he might be able to bang you on the head with it. But you've got a helmet on. He's pretty much got very little maneuverability. He can't move his feet. He can't move this thing around because he's wedged in. It's locked in with the guys behind him. 90 guys back, they don't know they've stalled at the front. They're still trying to move it forward. And what probably happens is the first four or five rows stuck in that bog die from suffocation. The English, meanwhile, move forward and engage them, engage them with swords and knives. James IV sees this, issues an instruction over here for them to leave the battlefield and hold the, hold the fords. That's one interpretation of what goes on. The other is that human hunting are cowards and they leave the battlefield. Um, and ultimately, they pay the price for that in 1518. He then is either with the third unit or joins the third unit. Dacre's cavalry relieve Edmund Howard. And we're told that when they relieve him, that he's fighting five knights single-handed, five Scottish knights. I think you can take that as his elder brother bigging him up, you know, trying to get rid of this wasteful, um, wasteful reputation and replacing it with a, a man of prowess on the battlefield. The antiquarian records of body pits kind of support this line in that there's one here. There's supposedly one on the edge of the bog, which is what we were looking for when we dug those five pits and didn't find. We did find a pet cemetery. I'll be having words with my geophysicist about that later on. The third unit down the hill is actually halfway to where the Earl of Surrey was standing. And I think, the, again, the accounts tell us that James gets to within one spear throw or 100 yards. Um, and this presumably is the sheer force of James's personal presence forcing his men through that bog. They may be using their own men, their own dead as a mat to cross it. Um, but the engagement appears to occur slightly further up the hill. The Highlanders on the right flank suffer the same fate at the hands of what Stanley has left, about half of his men. Um, the other half are over here, which is why they've always maintained they had a bad battle. The reason that this unit is successful is because there's a gap in the bog. There's a slight high ground in isthmus. And this is why I would tell you James is rot. Because if that bog, four to five metres wide, totally unique in its formation, we're not talking reeds and peat here, there's no peat or anything like that. If that hadn't existed, that flank would have turned, these guys would have hit into the English army, and we'd all be speaking French, both sides <laughs> of the border. I'm almost done. Can I go three more slides? The aftermath is difficult to, to quantify. The Scots presumably route in the direction of Coldstream along the Beaumont Water towards Yetham. 
The English army, we know, attacks Flodden Hill. We're told burns it to the ground. But in fact, we're not finding great evidence of mass burning on the top of Flodden Hill. That's probably a secondary source that's given us that. And they attack the Scots wagon train. 35 to 40,000 men, women and children. Somewhere, we don't know where. One secondary account suggests that uh, Lord Dacre had counted as many casualties in the wagon train as did on the battlefield. What happens on the battlefield occurs in the matter of an hour and a half. 10,000 dead Scotsmen, 2,500 dead Englishmen. To put that into perspective for you, um, the first hour of the Battle of the Somme, there are 11,000 British casualties. Here in an hour and a half, without heavy machine guns, without barbed wire, without effective heavy artillery, we've got 12,500 casualties. That's all knife work. The river is said to have run red. That's one of the things they always write. Uh, let's move on from that. I can give you another quick example. Um, British casualties, that's uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales for the whole of World War I, four years, 2.1% of the population. Here, if you include the casualties that may have happened in the wagon train, men, women, and children, we're talking about 2% of the Scottish population in a matter of hours. The effect this has on Scotland going forward can't be underestimated. And it's all because of that bog. The tragedy past this massive, massive occurrence of death is that Scotland actually come out on top 90 years later. Henry VIII's line is seedless. It can't sire a healthy heir. It can sire a healthy female heir, but in medieval terms, that's not what they want. Unfortunately, um, they don't seem to be able to get a healthy male heir. Uh, and in the, in the end, they have to turn to Scotland and ask James VI of Scotland to become their king. That should be victory for the Scots. Unfortunately, James goes down to London and writes back, I like it too much down here. I'm not coming back. <laughs> and it might be argued that that's weakness coming out of the fact that he didn't have a grandfather and a father and so on and so forth. All of that legacy of, Henry the, uh, of James IV. <coughs> One last footnote, the English borderers, borderers, whether they're English or Scottish is difficult here, there are literally clans fighting on both sides, detach themselves from the English army in the evening and go back across and attack um, Barmore camp, their own camp, because they haven't got enough booty to take home and they want a wee bit more. <laughs> If you want to join in, we have volunteers of all ages and experience, send me an email. Um, that's one of our websites, but the best way to keep in touch with what the archaeological project's doing is to get onto our mailing list. To wrap up, I'd like to leave you with one last thought, which isn't perhaps quite as um, unpleasant as the story of the battle, however abbreviated I've made it tonight. 300 years, this battle is known as the Scottish Field and the Battle of Branks and Moor. The name of Flodden only appears on five occasions. The current name only comes about in the 19th century, and I think this man and his mates are actually responsible for it. <coughs> if anybody can give me a rhyme for Brankston, I'd love to hear it, but you try rhyming Brankston. Flodden's a lot easier. It was sodden at Flodden. <laughs> you can't rhyme Brankston with anything. That's me. Thank you.